Good morning again. Today is part two of our series, When Pigs Fly. You know that, that phrase, when pigs fly, it's actually, it's a figure of speech. Is that there's, a name, uh, there's a name for it. Uh, it's called uh, adenata. Uh, can you say that? Adenata. Yeah, that's a, that's a figure of speech that they're, com- they're, they're, they're part of every culture. Uh, and what they are is they, they're just these phrases that become common to a culture to depict something that's not going to happen, right? So, so we say, like, when it's, something's not going to happen. It's impossible. We say, when pigs fly. Uh, every language has them. In English, uh, we, have, we have, you know, when pigs fly, or, or maybe you've heard when hell freezes over, right? Just not going to happen. Uh, or, for example, when the Mets win, right? Just, just not going to happen. Just something that we know is just highly unlikely, right? Uh, but every language, every language has them. Uh, Malayalam is the language that Pastor Lijo and Princey, uh, that's kind of where their, their, their culture of origin, uh, their language, well, they don't say when pigs fly. Uh, they say when the crow flies upside down. Okay, so same idea when pigs fly. In Germany, they say this. In Germany, they say when dogs bark with their tails. Right, not, not going to happen. In, in Hungary, this is interesting, when Hungary, they say when gypsy children are streaming from the sky. I don't know how that started. They're like, you know what, you know what I never see? Those gypsy children streaming from the sky. You know, that should be a phrase. That should be something that we just commonly say throughout our culture. Uh, in, in Turkey, uh, they say this. They say, when the garden is full of ducks holding pastry in their hands. It's kind of kind of overdone. It's a lot easier just to say when pigs uh, fly. That's kind of what we adenata. Well, this word adin, this ad, adenata it actually comes from a Greek word, uh, adunatos, and uh, this is a Greek word. It means the the, the word that means impossible. Uh, back in Jesus' day, Greek was the world language. It was the language everybody understood and spoke, kind of like English is today. Like, you know, everybody, there's languages, you know, hundreds of languages, but everywhere, uh, you know, English is spoken everywhere, except for Miami. But for everywhere else, uh, English is, is spoken. Well, Greek was like that. Greek was kind of that language that was spoken everywhere. And that's why the New Testament was written in Greek, if you ever uh, have wondered that. And so uh, we see this word, adunatos, in the Bible. In fact, uh, we see Jesus use this word when he said this. He said, Jesus said, uh, what is impossible for people is possible with God. Do you believe that? Jesus said it, what is impossible for people, adunatos, is possible for God. I like the way the common English translation uh, has it. Uh, It says, there are some things that people cannot do, but God can do, say it with me, anything. That's what we're talking about throughout this series. Uh, You know, I I am sure that there's probably, I'm positive there's something in your life that you just, you really are hoping would happen, you really wish would happen. But it just seems like it's impossible. Like maybe that loved one becoming a follower of Jesus or, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a financial turnaround. Maybe it's a, a turnaround in your health. And you'd love to see it, but, uh, but it just seems impossible. The truth is that, that, that most of the time, the stuff that we call impossible is not possible. But every once in a while, God intervenes and does the impossible. Do you believe that? We call that a miracle. Uh, A miracle for our definition throughout our series is when God intervenes for your good. He reaches into time and space, and he does something positive. He intervenes for your good and by doing something that only he 
can do. Now, I know there's a lot of different thoughts all over the place about uh, what people think about uh, a, a miracle. Uh, everything from there are those who would say there's always got to be some other explanation uh, to people who say it's a miracle every time their car starts, right? And I don't know, maybe for you it is a miracle every time your car starts. Uh, but there's kind of a whole different spectrum. And I would say uh, for myself, on my end, I tend to probably be a little bit skeptical on this, this topic. Like I'm pretty slow to call an event an actual miracle but I have seen it and I do believe it that every once in a while God will intervene and do the impossible and and I don't know why he does it sometimes and other times it seems like he doesn't we're going to talk about that next week Uh, but I, I I do believe that what I have seen him do in others lives he can do in my life and I believe that he can do it in yours as well. And that's why we're talking about that uh, throughout this month. Today, we're talking about a very specific kind of miracle that we see throughout Scripture, that we see in our lives, in people's lives, and maybe it's a, a miracle that you need. Uh, it's a miracle of provision. We're talking about when God intervenes to meet material need by providing what's lacking and out of reach, a miracle of provision. In uh, the the book of Philippians, letter to the Philippians, Paul wrote, and he gave these, these believers some good news. He said this. He said, my God will meet all your, say it, needs according to his riches, it, the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Now, I think if we're honest, we have all been here, right? Like, there's just some times when money can be tight. And it doesn't matter. I mean, if you are, you know, if, if you are a, a mother uh, with, 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 three kids or you are uh, a married parent with, with, with one kid, and there are times when money can be tight. Even if you make a really good income just because of expenses, uh, it comes to uh, insurances and, and, and college uh, debt or, or tuition or, uh, you know, mortgage and car, it can all add up. And sometimes there's just more month than there is money. Well, I'm praying that today, that today's message will be an encouragement to you. That as we look into scriptures and we see what God can do and we hear the stories of what God has done, that you will be encouraged to believe that God can intervene in your situation. That God can intervene for your good, that he can provide for what's lacking and what's out of reach for you. Before we jump all the way in, I just want to take a minute and I want to welcome and look in the camera and welcome all of you who are watching with us online. I know some are not able to be here, whether it's the weather or just physically, or maybe you live far away or you're just checking us out. Either way, whatever it is, we're glad that you are, are watching online uh, along with us. Uh, they uh, we should probably specifically welcome our Woodward Strong community uh, who are watching with us. Go ahead. Yeah, let's... let's let them hear. We're glad that they're here today and watching with us. Uh, I, I, I saw uh, on Woodward Strong's post today that, that Chelsea uh, invited people to watch online, and she said, uh, David is not boring. So that's a lot of pressure uh, right away, but we're going we're gonna, to uh, do our best anyway. So you've probably heard about, about Gladys, and Gladys is this single mom. She had three kids, and she was super, super poor. Like, she was so poor, she was po, right? Like, she couldn't afford the R. That's how poor uh, Gladys was. Uh, and so all the time, Gladys would cry out. She would cry out to God uh, for help in her need, and she would say, Oh, Lord, I need your help. So I need your provision. Jehovah Jireh, you're my provider, and I need you to supply all my needs. And so she would pray, and when she was just, she was, her family was hungry, she would cry out to God, and she would pray out loud, and her neighbors would hear her. And uh, she had this one neighbor, he was uh, an atheist, and he didn't believe in God, and he thought that she was just ridiculous. And for some reason, she just got under his skin. And when she would pray out, and he hear her praying, he would mock her, and she could hear him. He would mock her, and he would, he would, you know, he would, he would just laugh at her for praying. And she just ignored him, but she just kept on praying when she was in need. Oh, Lord, supply my needs. Well, one day she was praying, and this, it just, it just, and so this guy said, you know what, I'm going to mess with her. So he went to the grocery store, and he just, he just filled up his cart. He just bought all these groceries uh, for this woman, and he put them uh, in, a, in, in a shopping bags, and he went and he went right up to her door, and he put three grocery, full grocery bags right in front of her door, and he rang the doorbell, and he went and he hid. 
And uh, she comes to the door and she opens up the door and she sees these, these groceries right there. And she just throws, she just throws a fit. She just throws her hands in the air. And she says, oh, Jesus, I knew how good you were. Uh, you are my provider. I called to you and I was in need and you have provided all of my needs. And the man, just then he jumps out. And he says, you fool, God didn't provide for you. I provided for you. I'm the one that bought these groceries. God doesn't exist. You're a fool. Without taking even a break, she just throws her, pan her hands back up in the air. And she says, oh, Jesus, you are even better than I thought. Not only did you provide for all my needs, you made the devil pay for it. We're talking about a good God who sees us in our need, and he will intervene uh, to bring good, uh, to supply our material needs in our lives. Well, in, in the Bible, there are, there are several stories uh, of this. We see it in every story of need that we see throughout Scripture, uh, there is a miracle of provision just waiting to happen. Uh, and, uh, and we see this in, 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 a, in a number of different stories, but there's one really iconic story where we see this need that God provides. Uh, it's found in the gospel. and In fact, it's found in every gospel. Other than Jesus' death and resurrection, there's only one story that's actually found in all uh, of the gospels, and it's this story of when Jesus feeds the 5,000. You're probably familiar with it. I, I want to look at it from the way that Luke tells this story. He starts out, he says this, this is when Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority authority to drive out all the demons and to cure diseases. We talked about this last week. If you uh, missed part one of uh, When Pigs Fly, we talked last week about miracles of freedom and how God will intervene to defeat the forces of darkness uh, and free you from the stuff that holds you back. So you can uh, check that out online. Uh, so he, 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 uh, he, he, he sends them out. He says he sends them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal all of the sick. And so they're, they're, they go out and they do that. And then uh, a few verses down, we read that when the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Uh, and then, they, then he took them with him and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. So they come back, they're super jazzed up about all that has happened. They're telling him story after story of what they've seen God do. And he says, this is amazing. All right, let's get some rest. So, so let's pull away uh, from the crowds and let's go and try to get a by ourselves and get some rest, but they're not having it. The crowds learned about it, and they followed him. Uh, and so Jesus, he doesn't turn them away. He welcomes them, and he speaks. He teaches them about the kingdom of God uh, and how God is, 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 he is unraveling uh, the work of evil, and he is bringing good. And then he shows it. He healed all who needed Healing. That's March 24th, the last week of this, the last part of this series. We're going to be talking about miracles of healing. And I, I want to encourage you, uh, if you need healing or you know someone who needs healing, to come and to be a part of that service. We're going to talk about how God uh, intervenes to do the miraculous. We've seen it. We're going to talk about it. And we're going to have a time of prayer at the end where if you want to receive healing, you can come and receive those prayers for healing. So anyway, this is happening. He's teaching. He's healing. It's going on and on all day long. Uh, and then we see this, that late in the afternoon, the 12, those disciples, they came to him and they said, send the crowd away so that they can go get, so they can go to the surrounding villages out there, find food and lodging because we are in a remote place here. So, you know, go send them. Uh, they need to get food. Uh, but Jesus, he has a different idea. He says this. He says, you give them something to eat. Uh, well, they answered, <laughs> we only have five loaves and bread and two fish unless we go buy food for all of this crowd. And there were 5,000 people there, just men alone on top of women and children. So Jesus, he, he's, he's not uh, phased by this. He says, have everybody sit down. And then taking uh, the five loaves and the two fish and then looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and he broke them, and then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to all the people. And here's what happened. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Now, in this story, 
We see three, we see kind of condensed into this one miracle, three principles that I want to I share with you. I want to uh, give you to take away three principles of how God does these miracles of provision. There are, there are three truths that you can count on in your area of, of material need. Three things that are true that, that, about how God will can and will provide for what is lacking and what is out of reach for you. So uh, three things. If you have your weekly, there's, there are a note sheet in there, and if you want to follow along and write those down, uh, you can do that if you'd like to take notes. Here we go. Number, number one uh, is this, that when God gives a vision, he also supplies the provision. When God gives a vision, he also supplies the provision. As the story starts, right, all the disciples can see is the problem. They can only see that there's just a, there's a, there's a whole ton of people and we just got a little bit of food. Uh, and so, you know, they, they, they think to themselves, hey, uh, let's, let's make dinner their problem before these, all these people become our problem. But Jesus, he has a different vision. So, so he starts, before he directs anything, before he tells them to do anything, he begins by giving them a vision, helping them to see uh, what, 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 what he sees. He says, you give them something to eat. Here's a vision. How about if you are the solution to this problem? Well, the Gospel of John tells this same story, and, and, and he tells us this. He says that when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, hey, Phil, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? And he asked this only to test him for, for catch this, watch this, I love this. For he, Jesus, already had in mind what he was going to do. I love that. Jesus already knew what he was up to. Jesus had no intention of guiding his friends, his disciples, his followers into something without also providing what they needed to accomplish that. You get this? You got to hear this. Jesus will not guide you into his followers. He will not guide you into anything that he's not also going to provide what you need to accomplish it. You see, he gave a vision, and when he gives a vision, he also supplies the provision. When Carrie and I moved here from Florida, we left a larger church to come to a much smaller church, and with that, of course, uh, came a, a little bit smaller income, and, and, and we knew that uh, with eyes wide open, and, uh, and, and, and we, uh, you know, we're not awesome. We just really believe that this is where God was guiding us into, and we have seen, and we had seen our entire lives that when there's a vision, God also provides, also supplies the provision. He always uh, takes care. Whenever he guides, uh, he he also uh, provides, and he has certainly done that. Uh, he has always provided uh, for us here. Uh, we've never really been in want. Sometimes it's been through uh, it's, it's been through uh, extra, you know, the opportunities to earn extra. Sometimes it's been through envelopes and gifts out of nowhere. Uh, sometimes uh, it, it's been through uh, just just giving us uh, the opportunity to learn a better way to to, to manage our own finances. Uh, you know, sometimes and we got to admit this, right? Sometimes God provides, uh, you know all that we need, but we spent it on all that we want. And so that's a whole different story. But God has always provided uh, for us. I have a vision for Capital Church. Uh, I, I, I can see uh, Capital Church in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, a visible, prominent, easily accessible location in a building that is just awesome for families to bring kids to that's just focused on that. Uh, a building, uh, a facility that you are excited to bring your family and your friends to. I see in Capital Church... Uh, planting three churches uh, around this capital region so that we can bring this message uh, and this plan for following Jesus uh, into new places and new areas uh, all around here. Uh, I see our online presence expanding so that we can increase our reach, uh, not just locally, but, but all around uh, the world. I have a vision for these things. They, they will all require material provision beyond what we have, but I believe that whenever God gives a vision, he also supplies the provision. I want you to hear this because I really believe, and I know that this is true for some of you because I've had conversations with you, and I believe it's true for others, uh, th that, that God has put a vision in your heart. There's something that God is calling you to, and it's bigger than what you're doing now. It's bigger than what you can even picture, but God has put this vision in your heart. 
And I'm sure there are many dreams here that I haven't even talked to you about, that I don't know about, that God has put that in your heart. And you're thinking, you know, it could be something like, uh, you know, adopt, adoption or opening your home to foster care. It could be about starting a business or, or expanding uh, your business so that you can use that in order to, to make a difference in others' lives. Uh, it, it could be about financially supporting a missionary or, or, or starting to tithe. Uh, it, it could be about going back to school or ta- back to some training because uh, to, to pursue a calling that you hit pause on a long time ago. Whatever it is, I, I, bet, I bet there are people here God is, is calling you into something uh, new, something uh, that's, that's, that, that's bigger than you, some uncharted waters that, that may feel a little bit scary. And what you don't understand and what you don't know, you, you can't see is how you're going to do that. I hope you be encouraged today to know that Jesus already has in mind how he's going to do that. And if he has given you a vision, he will also supply the provision. You with me? Number two, when you give, God multiplies. Uh, this, as John tells the story, Jesus, uh, we, we read this, that another one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Uh, and so he, he tells us, here's how, the, here's how the, 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 the fish and the loaves came to Jesus. This is Andrew, uh, he spoke up and he said, hey, uh, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But, I mean, how far will that go among so many? I, I love this kind of the, the switch in tone here. Uh, this is kind of how I picture it. I think Andrew, uh, you know, the boy comes up and he offers this, the, his lunch to Andrew. And, I mean, I don't think that Andrew stole it from the kid. I think that he, you know, the boy offered it. And so Andrew, uh, you know, he's maybe thinking, ah, oh, this is not very much. But he knows he's hardly in the New Testament already. So he wants to kind of get in there a little bit. So he speaks up and he brings, he brings the fish and the loaves to Jesus and he, he throws it out there. Hey, here's, here's some bread and some fish. But his brother Peter, right? His, uh, why is that mentioned? His brother Peter is there and he gives his brother, the, he gives his brother Andrew the stink eye. And he's like, come on, Andrew. Five, two fish. You're humiliating the family. What do you do? So, so Andrew immediately backs down. He's afraid. He says, but I mean, how far would that go, Jesus? Right? I mean, that's, that was a stupid idea. Get out of here, you dumb kid. But anyway, Jesus takes that. That's how I, I pictured it happening. But Jesus takes that. Uh, and although it's not enough, he makes it more than enough. Paul writes this to the church in Corinth. He says, This generous God who supplies abundant seed for the farmer, which becomes bread for our meals, is even more extravagant towards you. He says, he First, he supplies every need plus more. Then he multiplies the seed as you sow it. When you give, he, God, multiplies it so that the harvest of your generosity will grow. It just keeps on going. God will miraculously multiply what you give. So this principle uh, we see really all throughout the Bible. It goes all the way back to the beginning uh, of Genesis. We see Abraham is called the tithe. Abraham, uh, he's the first one to tithe. 400 years later, Moses is like, I've seen this consistently be a principle that's true over and over again, so much so it's, it's basically like a law. Uh, and so he codifies it. And then when Jesus is on earth, he says, yeah, this is definitely something that you should do. It's a way to honor God and it's a way to participate uh, in the mission uh, of that God is doing and miraculously multiplying what you give. So the practice of tithing, if you're not familiar, it's, uh, it, we see it throughout the Bible, is to give the first 10% uh, of your income, uh, and that's the first tenth because that's God is, is, is first, and so it's this expression of worship, uh, and then to give that to the local church uh, as a way to participate in in the mission of the church, uh, the mission uh, that, that God has given the church to, to help people know God and find freedom and discover their purpose so that they can make a difference. And the principle of tithing is this, that if you will give, God will multiply it. In fact, it's the only place, it's the only area where God not only gives permission, but also invites you to test them. He's like, hey, Just try to test this out. And so he says this. He says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and test me in this. See if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. 
Because when you give, God multiplies. Carrie and I, we grew up in, my wife and I, we grew up in homes that tithed. Our parents taught us to tithe. They modeled it. And so uh, it's just kind of always been a part of my life. I, I literally can't remember not tithing. Like the minute that the, the, when I first got my job to this day, I've just always lived on 90% of my paycheck. Uh, and God has always passed his own test. He's always proven himself to be faithful. We saw this as a church here at Capital Church. Uh, about 10 years ago, we were, uh, we were like at our lowest point financially. Uh, in fact, I, I can still remember the board meeting. We were all sitting around the table staring at the papers, like hoping if we stared long enough, the numbers would move around or something uh, like that. Uh, and we were just kind of stunned uh, at, at, at that moment. And it was just silent in the room. And funny enough, on that agenda, that same night uh, was something that I felt like God had put uh, on my heart, uh, just kind of like a put your money where your mission is. And, uh, it, it, and you know, we, we, we said, basically said it this way, listen, if we're asking our people to tithe, then we as a church should also be tithing. And so it was on that night we made a decision that from this point forward, 10% of all the tithe uh, that is given uh, by you is Right off the top, 10% is taken and put into a fund simply dedicated toward missions. And so supporting missionaries and doing uh, serving and, and, and reaching out uh, to people who are outside of these walls. You know, from the minute that we made that decision uh, forward, we began, we began to see increase uh, in health and growth uh, financially as a church. And in 10 years from that decision, we have put uh, over $400,000 into dollars into missions work. So that's beautiful. And that's your faithfulness. That's your faithfulness. Now, we don't know where most of that $400,000 is gone. We don't know how that has multiplied in various ways. But I'll tell you one story, one thing we do know. Uh, last week, you might have heard me, if you were here, you, you heard me tell the story about a missions trip that we went as Capital Church into a place in Guatemala. It's a small, remote village called Castulo. And it is so remote that there was no roads to get there. Like we had to take a boat for an hour and a half, and then we had to walk through, uh, we had to walk, hike another mile and a half uh, through swamp and woods to get finally to this clearing. They were so remote that they didn't speak Spanish, the, the language of Guatemala. They had their own language. This is a lost Mayan tribe. They were so remote that the government of Guatemala did not recognize their existence. Uh, like they literally, these people did not count as far as Guatemala was concerned. And so because of that, they could not get any aid, uh, any, any uh, financial aid, but any uh, medical aid or any food supplies or anything like that because they were just not there. Uh, and so um, these people need, these people had tremendous need. The missionaries, when they found them, these people were incredibly malnutritioned and they were just, they, they, they were uneducated uh, because they were isolated. They just didn't have even just basic uh, common knowledge. For example, uh, they were doing things like washing their dishes downstream from where they were going to the bathroom. Uh, they were uh, cooking over open fires inside their home with no ventilation. And so their children were dying uh, of smoke inhalation. The, the, the more Mortality rate, the infant mortality rate was just uh, unbelievable. Uh, and so uh, the missionaries, they had a vision. Uh, they, they, they had this vision that if we could build a school, if we could build a school, then we could start with the kids and we could begin to educate the kids. And if we could just teach them Spanish, if we could teach them uh, just kind of basic, uh, just basic knowledge, they could then go into the city of Guatemala. They could then go and they could learn. Uh, they, could, they could go to high school there. They could go to college there. They could learn trades and skills that they could bring back to their village uh, and begin to help them develop. Uh, and so this was the vision, and they, they contacted us as their mission partners, uh, and they said, hey, we've done the research, and we'd like to build a school here. We can build a one-room schoolhouse for, guess how much? $2,500, right? So for $2,500, we can build this school. So the Capital Church, we were uh, much smaller then, under, well under 100 people. Uh, you gave, you, you raised that money, raised that $2,500, and we went and we built uh, that school. Well, long story short, now, uh, years later, what happened was this. Uh, the, the, the kids started going to school. School was built. They started going to school. They started to learn. They, they went. They began to, to now uh, be able to go to these high schools and these, uh, these universities. And in fact, they began to, and they, they were excelling there. 
And they were coming back uh, with the, with not only as uh, as you know as as teachers and as nurses, uh, but but they were also they were doing so well that the government took notice. Uh, and the government, uh, because of this school, they said, there's something going on here. Uh, and they formally recognized Castulo uh, as a legitimate part of Guatemala, which meant now they were able to receive medical aid and financial assistance uh, and, and uh, food supplies. Uh, and uh, at this point, not only uh, is all of this going on, but the, the, the government of Guatemala built a road from the city uh, right directly to Castulo because they want other uh, n- neighboring villages to be able to be a part of this school and what this is going on. Uh, that, those kids now have a future they never, ever, ever would have had because you gave just $2,500. But when you give, God multiplies. He supplies all your needs plus so much more. Number three, when others need a miracle of provision, you might be it. You know, I, I love this story. Luke tells how far this boy's lunch goes. They all ate, and they were satisfied, and there were 12 bus- basketfuls, basketfuls left over. Uh, when I think of, of, of this story, the, the feeding of the 5,000, you know, I always think like, look, wow, look at what Jesus did. Jesus did it. And, and absolutely, Jesus did it. But, you know, uh, I think about the disciples too. They got a lot of thank yous. You know, if, uh, if you were, uh, imagine uh, those, those people who were, were, were hungry, who were getting food, you know, they were thanking the disciples for giving them food. So that had to feel good to be a distributor. If you've ever been a distributor of good, you know the good that that feels. But I, I think about the boy, right? This little boy. Who, who knows how little he gave. He just gave his lunch, uh, and he saw all of this happen. I mean, he had to feel great to be a part of this miracle story. In the Old Testament, a lot of what we see in ministry is we see kind of top-down ministry. We see God kind of intervening uh, and doing these things out of, out of nowhere, uh, and there seems to be no explanation uh, for that. In the New Testament, the tone kind of changes when it comes to miracles, uh, and, and it's because God gives his Holy Spirit. And in the New Testament, we see God not working top-down, but we see him working through us, through us to one another. Paul writes this, He says, look, here's how this works. You will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those in need, they will thank who? God. Paul paints a picture. He's like, look, so God's going to equip you. God's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna provide for you everything you need. Because look, when God gives a vision, he also supplies the provision, right? So, so, so he's gonna call you to do something and he's gonna equip you to be able to do that. So if you're obedient and you'll do that, here's what'll happen. Those people in need, they'll receive what you give and God, when you give, God's gonna multiply that. Uh, and when you, and when you do that, then, then this is gonna come back. Their need is gonna be supplied and God is the one Because he's done this miracle through you, God is the one who's going to get the glory. He's saying, hey, God may be inviting you into someone else's miracle story. Hey, he's saying, your obedience could be someone else's miracle. Because when others need a miracle of provision, you just might be it. I, I see this, this happening uh, in, in a few ways here at Capital. One is our online ministry uh, because you give uh, and, uh, and enable us to, to, to develop this live stream. And we've got a lot that we want to do in order to, to make it much better than it is. But, but God, we believe that God's going to provide the provision for that. Uh, but because you do that, uh, people who are otherwise not able to be here or able to watch are able to watch and be a part of this. Uh, so we do this and we, we stream our services on Facebook uh, and on our, our online campus that's through our website as well as on our app. Uh, and every once in a while, someone will kind of comment as to, as to where they're watching from or, or, or something like that. And last week, just an example, we had somebody who wrote in from Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And she just said this. She said, no church even remotely close to me just found my church. We take church for granted because there's one on every corner, right? Yeah, yeah, 
God gets glory for that. We take, we take, we take church for granted because it's, it's on every corner. But if you were living in a remote place where there was no church close to you, uh, it's because you gave that that need was supplied. It's what she was lacking and was out of reach. But because you gave, uh, you, God supplied that need. Uh, another example is our help center. Uh, last month, we took a, an offering for the help center, and it's kind of to raise our budget for the help center, the, the food budget for the year. And what our help center is, is our help center is a food and clothing pantry. Uh, we serve those who are food insecure here in the capital region. These are people who don't know where their next meal is. Uh, they very likely will go hungry. Food is what is lacking, and it's out of reach for them. Uh, if you think that that's not prevalent here, you may be surprised to learn that actually 12% of the capital region is food insecure. Uh, and so our ability to provide that uh, is, 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 is awesome. And so anyway, in that offering you gave, uh, over $1,800, which translates because of our partnership with the food bank into 9,250 meals for people. This year, there will be people who will be lacking and food will be out of reach, but because you gave, God will use that to do a miracle in their lives. I'll tell you one more story, and we'll be done. Uh, many of you have been following the story of Joss and Chelsea Woodward. Uh, Joss and Chelsea are, are members of our church, and about a month ago now, uh, Josh became very, very sick, and he went into septic shock. And the sepsis uh, that struck his body was so violent, so aggressive, uh, that it just it spread through his entire body. And, and there was the one night where we were told that he had only a 5% chance to make it through that night. Uh, a doctor off the record told me, we say 5% when we mean 0%. There was no expectation that Josh was going to be alive and be able to survive that. But we saw God do a miracle a real live miracle of healing in that situation. I'll tell you the rest of the story on March 24th. But not only did God do a miracle of healing in that story, God also did a miracle of provision. You see, uh, on that first day when Josh became sick, somebody else, not them, somebody else started to go fund me for them. And as of, as of last night, that was up to $107,000 to provide for their needs. You know what's so cool about that? The average gift is under 50. I mean, it's over, there's, there's 2, 000, uh, over 2,000 people who, who said, uh, I'm going to be a little bit part of this, this, this miracle. Well, well let, me, let me tell you, uh, this past week, this, this roller coaster of recovery has had really highs and it's had some really deep lows. Uh, and this week in, in, in Josh's battle, uh, as in every battle, there's casualties. Uh, and this week we, 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 we discovered that there was a, because of all the dead tissue in his right hand, there was new bacteria that was, it was causing new bacteria, causing new infections. Uh, and and uh, it, was, it was not going, it, it wasn't going to change uh, that hand. It was his hand uh, for his life. Now Jesus even said, hey, if it's your hand for your life, then just cut that off. That's a good deal every time. And so, uh, so, so his hand, his hand was, was removed. Now I can imagine, I can imagine myself responding all kinds of ways uh, about that. Uh, but I, I got to tell you, and I'm sure you've seen online, the way Josh and Chelsea have responded to that with incredible faith and grace and peace and love. It's been inspiring. Josh has said things like, hey, this is bigger than me. And if God's got some purpose that's bigger than, bigger than me, then that's cool. The day, it was a couple days actually before that actually happened, uh, I was talking with, with Chelsea, and, and here's, here's what I, what, what I want to show you. So I was talking with Chelsea and, uh, and, and about this, and she was just kind of telling me uh, about how she had peace. And Josh and her both had peace ever since they first were told by the doctor that this is uh, where this was headed. Uh, and so we were texting, and she said this. She said, I had a thought. We prayed for the full restoration of the hand. Well, it will be, just different, because they're talking about prosthetics and what they can do with all of that. But here's the miracle, she said. God already provided the funding. So... Just saying. 
Josh and Chelsea had no idea that they were going to need a miracle of provision like this. But you know what? God already knew how he was going to do it. And those 2,183 people who gave are all part of their miracle story. And maybe some of you here in this room, you are a part of their miracle. I tell you these stories because I believe that what God has done for others, he can do for you in your need. And I believe that what God has done through others, he can do through you. And I gotta tell you, I don't know which is more awesome, to receive a miracle or to be one. But I believe that for every story of need, there is a miracle of provision waiting to happen. For every story of need, there is a miracle of provision just waiting to happen. Maybe your need, maybe you're the miracle. What is your own miracle of provision story? Hey, if you've got one, if you've got a story of how God has, has, has provided for you, or you've got a story how God used you to provide for someone else, tell that story, capitalstories.org. You can go on there and you can share your story. And, and the reason uh, I kind of leave this as, as an action step for you uh, fo- following out of this, because the truth is, is that uh, what has been life-changing for you can be life-giving for others. And when you tell your story, you give God the glory. And you build up people's faith to believe and to call on God to do the same for them. Would you bow your heads with me? God, we thank you for today. We thank you for this morning. And God, we thank you for your word. We believe your word that when you give a vision, you will also supply the provision. We believe that when we give, God, you will multiply that. And we believe that when others need a miracle, it just might be us whom you choose to work through. And we thank you for your word. Many of you here this morning or watching online, you are in need right now. There may be a material need. And there's more month than there is money. God's called you to do something and you don't see how it's possible. There is something lacking and it just feels out of reach. And that financial turnaround, that debt that's weighing on you, it just feels like it's impossible to ever see your way through. This morning, if that's you, if you say, listen, I need the God of miracles. I need a miracle of provision in my life. Would you just raise your hand high so I can pray with you? Yes. 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 I need a miracle of provision in my life. Or maybe you know someone who does and you want to pray for them. You just raise your hand. Yes, 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 yes. God, we come before you right now. We thank you. We thank you that you are a generous God. God, we thank you for your word, for your promises, uh, that, that, that you will supply all of our needs according to your riches, the riches that are, in, that are ours in Christ Jesus. God, we thank you that in every story of need, there is a miracle of provision waiting to happen. God, I pray right now, Lord, uh, that you would work in our lives. God, I pray that you would show yourself real. And God, whether it's, it, it's, it's money from nowhere, whether it's a, it's, it's a, it's a new job or an opportunity uh, to, to, to earn or, or whether it's a, it's a better financial plan and it's, uh, it, it's you helping us uh, and guiding us to, to, to deal with it better. God, I pray, Lord, that you would show yourself up, that you would show up and you would show yourself real, God, in, in our lives, that you would perform a miracle of provision for every person that's here. While you're still praying, I just want to say one more thing. You know, our, 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 our financial need, our material need is not our deepest need. The deepest need for every single person, every single human being is our spiritual need. And you may be here today and, and finances may be one concern, but, but, but you've walked in with a much heavier burden. And maybe today you feel a lot of guilt over the stuff you've done. And maybe you feel like God is a million miles away. Or maybe you just have this nagging suspicion that you can't shake, that there's more to this life than what you can see and touch. And I just want to suggest to you that those feelings and that suggestion, they're all pointing to what's true. That you 
were created by God on purpose. That he knew you and that he, he sees you. And he created you to know him, to be free from that, that, that stuff, that junk that holds you back, to live a life of purpose. The problem is that when we choose to go away from God, we break that relationship and there's nothing we can do to get it back. We have a deep spiritual need and we cannot provide the solution. The great news is, the great news is that God has provided everything you need for that spiritual, for that spiritual need. He's provided Jesus. Jesus came and he lived and he died on the cross to pay our debt, to satisfy that spiritual debt And he rose from the dead and he invites you into a brand new relationship with God. And his offer is simple and it's this. If you will put your trust in him and invite him into your life, he will forgive your sins. He will give you his spirit to help you to follow him and to serve him. This morning, if you're here you would say, I need that. I need to, to, to get right with God and I'm ready to put my trust in Jesus. This morning you would say, I want to invite Jesus into my life. Would you just raise your hand? Yes. Yes. Anyone else? You could put your hands down. Listen, if you raised your hand this morning or, or you wanted to, or you're watching online and you want to turn toward God, you want to invite Jesus into your life, would you pray this prayer with me? If you are a follower of Jesus, would you confirm your faith by praying with me? Jesus, thank you. Thank you for being what I needed to get right with God. Thank you for paying my debt, for forgiving my sins. I put my trust in you as the one to rescue me and free me and heal me, be the leader of my life. I invite you into my life. Give me your spirit to help me to follow you and serve you. 